Okay, I'm ready. Okay. Um, yeah. Welcome back. Today we will have Dr. Ravinel to the second lecture of the mini course on telescope conjecture. So please. Did I start? Yep. Okay. So this is the second lecture, and I'm going to begin by recalling things that I told you in the first lecture. So there's this graded ring called the Lazard ring, which uh, <clears throat> supports the universal formal group law. So uh, <clears throat> that means that if you have a formal group law F over any ring R, that is induced, it will be induced by a homomorphism theta from the Lazard ring to R. And Quillen showed that if we consider the formal group law that arises in MU theory, that's, that is uh, <clears throat> the formal group law over MU star, uh, <clears throat> the homomorphism uh, theta that induces that is an isomorphism. So MU star is isomorphic to the Lazard ring. And there is a, a Hopf algebroid that is an affine group, groupoid scheme consisting of uh, mu star and mu lower star mu. And I described that uh, toward the end of the last lecture. And it represents the functor that assigns to each ring R the groupoid of formal group laws over R and strict isomorphisms between them. So we have, ex we know that mu star mu is a polynomial algebra over mu lower star on generators b1, b2, and so on, where the dimension of b sub i is 2i. Um, and there's an affine group scheme represented by the, in addition to that, there's an affine group scheme that is a Hopf algebra represented by the ring b, which is the polynomial algebra over the integers on those same generators. Um, um, okay, the corresponding functor, the functor that's represented by this B assigns to each ring R the group under functional composition of formally invertible power series of the form f of x equals x plus various higher order terms, and the bi's are the coefficients of those higher terms. Now, um, the group, uh, so this group of power series, of, of, of a power series where the uh, coefficient of x is, the, is one, uh, this is defined for any ring r, and the group for the corresponding group for the integers acts on the Lazard ring in the following way. Um, if we've got a uh, if we we if we've got a power series f of x, um, we can define a uh, new formal group law over L by the formula that you see here. This formal group law is induced by some kind of Autom ring automorphism from L to itself. So this defines an action of the group GZ on L. Um, are there any questions? That went by rather quickly. All right. Um, so, M so as I said, MU star MU has the is is the polynomial algebra over mu star on those generators bi now for any spectrum x mu star of x is a comodule over that gadget and for any such comodule we can define an x group associated with it so that's x over mu star mu of mu star into m <clears throat> now if M happens to be the MU homology of a spectrum X, then this X group is the E2 term of the Adams-Novikov spectral sequence 
which converges in favorable circumstances to the homotopy of the spectrum X. So this is a tool for calculating uh, the homotopy of a spectrum X, and it converges uh, in many cases. So the the usual the the Adams Novak so if X is the sphere spectrum this is the Adams Novikov spectral sequence converging to the stable homotopy groups of spheres. Now, if you're in the p local setting, it's more convenient to do this in terms of BP theory. So remember, BP star was a polynomial algebra uh, that's uh, a lot smaller than MU star. It has far fewer uh, algebra generators. And BP lower star of X is a co-module over BP lower star of BP. And um, for any such co-module, I'm going to use the same notation uh, uh, that I use. That, so you'll on this page, you see X to M defined in two different ways. So the first definition is when you're in a global setting. The second definition is when you're in a P local setting. And uh, I'm hoping that the it'll be clear from the context which of these I'm talking about. Um, <clears throat> so let's fix a number P throughout the rest of the talk of this lecture. Um, for each H, for each positive integer H, we have a prime ideal of the following form in L, and it's related to formal group laws of height at least, height at P of at least H. Now, in 1973, Peter Landwaber showed that these are the only prime ideals in mu star that are invariant under the action of the group G. These are the only invariant prime ideals that, that occur in L. Now L has, L is this huge polynomial ring, so it has many, many prime ideals, but the only ones that are invariant under the action of the group G are the ones that I've just, the ones that I've just defined. So I'm going to use the same notation for the analogous prime ideals in BP star. And Landweber's theorem says that they are the only ones, uh, <clears throat> they are the only prime ideals in BP star, which are also co-modules over BP lower star BP. And there is a short exact sequence of such co-modules that goes like this. And um, I'm going to call this particular uh, short exact sequence, the H Greek letter sequence. So um, this is defined for any positive value of H. And in particular, um, if H is one, then uh, the first guy in the sequence is uh, BP star mod I zero. I zero is defined to be the zero ideal and V zero is defined to be P. So, um, <clears throat> so if H is one, this is the sequence that's, uh, this is the sequence uh, that is induced by multiplication by P on uh, <clears throat> BP star. And as I said, I'm gonna refer to this as the H Greek letter sequence. So if H is one, I'm gonna call this the alpha sequence. If H is two, I'll call it the beta sequence and so on. We'll come back to these later. Um, now I'm gonna describe uh, a picture that I learned from Jack Morava in 1973. And I have, that was 50 years ago. It's been etched in my brain ever since. Um, <clears throat> It was the subject of an AMS bulletin announcement that he never that was never published, and he recently dug up a copy of it, sent it to me. Uh, it was uh, <clears throat> it was he found it in his attic, I think. Um, he sent it to me. It was very hard to read. I posted it on my archive, and then um, <clears throat> John Rogness retypeset it, so it's a bit, it's much easier to read now. Um, so here it goes. V is going to stand, is going to denote the vector space of ring homomorphisms from L to FP bar. 
The reason that I put vector space in quotation marks is that in order to define uh, a, an, a, an addition operation on this set of ring homomorphisms, you need to choose uh, polynomial generators of L. The, so the addition, the, the addition operation depends on a choice of polynomial generators of L. Now, in what follows, I'm never going to make use of this uh, addition operation. So I don't have to specify uh, a choice of generators. <clears throat> now, each point in this set of ring homomorphisms corresponds to a formal group law over FP bar, because remember, every formal group law over any ring at all is induced by a homomorphism from L to that ring. So we're considering the case where the ring is FP bar, that is the algebraic closure of FP. So each, each point in this, each such homomorphism corresponds to a formal group law over FP bar. And um, there is an action on V of the group um, that, so the group is fancy G is the group of power series ring, power series uh, of the appropriate sort over FP bar and then you uh, <clears throat> take the semi-direct product of that with FP bar cross, the group of units in FP bar. <clears throat> and um, each orbit of that group action is an isomorphism class of formal group laws over FP bar. Now, we know uh, but a theorem of Lazard tells us what those isomorphism classes are. There's one for each height. So there's one orbit of this thing for each height, including infinity. Um, <clears throat> and for each point X in this V, there's an isotropy group or stabilizer group G sub X. So that's the elements and the group fancy G that, uh, fix X. So that is the automorphism group of the corresponding form of the formal group law corresponding to X. Now, when X has height H, this is isomorphic to what is now known as the Morava stabilizer group S sub H. And I will describe this group explicitly uh, in a moment. Um, so there's more to this. Um, so again, V is the vector space of ring homomorphisms from L to FP bar. And um, there are uh, subspaces uh, of, there are certain subspaces of uh, finite codimension. This V is an infinite dimensional vector space and there are certain subspaces of finite codimension where V sub H is the elements, the set of elements theta in V, such that uh, theta sends the first H minus one Vs to zero. Now, uh, again, I wanna emphasize that the, the particular choice of these Vs um, uh, doesn't matter because uh, V1 is, there's only one choice of V1, um, and the other, in the other cases, um, <clears throat> uh, the choice only matters modulo decomposables. So the these subspaces are independent of the, the ch any choices you have to make. Um, <clears throat> so we will call this the Morava filtration of V. So it's a collection of uh, finite dimension, finite co-dimensional subspaces, and the height h orbit is. Uh, v sub h minus v sub h minus one. So it's the set of points that are in v sub h, but not in v sub h plus one. Um, so this is the set of FP valued homomorphisms on uh, the ring that you get by killing all the lower v's and then inverting v sub h. And we'll, this fact will be used later. Um, now, you could also consider the intersection of all these subspaces, and that is the height infinity orbit. Now, 
this intersection isn't zero. This, I'm not claiming that this intersection is, is zero. The intersection is not zero. There are lots of uh, formal group laws over FP bar that are ice that have height infinity, meaning they're isomorphic to the additive formal group law, but they're not actually the additive formal group law. <clears throat> so um, now I'm going to describe the endomorphism ring and automorphism group of a height H formal group law over a field K of characteristic P that contains FP to the H. It's the same for any, this works for any field that contains FP to the H. So in particular, it works for FP bar. So in order to do this, I need some notation. <clears throat> so W is going to denote the VIT ring for the field FP to the H. Now, if uh, H is one, this is the VIT ring for FP, and that means the p-adic integers. Um, now, fp to the h is an extension of the p-adic integers obtained by adjoining uh, roots of p to the h minus one, p to the h minus one roots of unity. You adjoin such roots of unity to the p-adic integers, and you get this this ring uh, wfp, the vit ring for fp to the h. Um, it's a complete local ring, and the residue field, and, the, and its residue field is FP to the H, and it's an extension of ZP of degree H. Um, and it has an automorphism sigma that lifts the Frobenius automorphism of the residue field. Now, the Frobenius automorphism of the residue field, uh, FP to the H, is the automorphism that sends every element to its p power, and that element, that automorphism always has uh, <clears throat> order h. If you do it h times, you get the, it's the identity. <clears throat> and this automorphism is known to generate the Galois group of fp to the h over fp. And it has this automorph, this Frobenius automorphism has a lifting to WFP to the H, and I'm calling that lifting sigma. And I'm going to denote the image of an element in W uh, by W to the sigma. Now, um, the endomorphism, what I'm calling end sub H, is the ZP algebra obtained from W by adjoining an element S um, now, S is a non-commuting indeterminate, and it satisfies this. It, it fails to commute with elements in W, as indicated by this formula. Um, S followed by W is equal to W to the sigma followed by S. This is for any little w in big W. And we also set S to the H power equal to P. So this is a degree H extension of W. And that means in particular that it is, as a ZP module, it is a free ZP module of rank H squared. And we'll see that this is in fact the endomorphism ring of our formal group law. Um, <clears throat> now, I want so I want to describe how this thing acts on the mod p reduction of the Honda formal group law. Um, <clears throat> now the Honda formal group law is defined over the p-adic integers. I want to think of it as a I want to consider it over this larger ring, uh, the vit ring W. Um, <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> any element in this ring that I've just defined can be written uniquely as a power series in S um, where each coefficient has the property that each coefficient lives in W and has the property that it's equal to its P to the H power. Um, so that means that each 
each, each of these coefficients EI is either zero or a root of unity, an appropriate root of unity. Um, now, the logarithm of the Honda formal group law is given by this formula. Um, it involves, it's a power series where every exponent is congruent to one modulo p to the h minus one. This means that uh, if I pick an element omega in W that's either a root of unity or zero, um, uh, it follows that log of omega x is equal to omega times log of x, where the, this is the, the Honda logarithm. So that means that the Honda formal group law has an endomorphism that's, that's defined by sending x to omega times x. Now, this is not a strict and this is not a strict isomorphism because the coefficient of x isn't one. But the nice thing about it is typically an, an endomorphism is defined by a power series on x with suitable properties. And in this case, the power series is simply omega times x. Now, the endomorphism. Uh, move this up to here. The endomorphism corresponding to this uh, power series in S is the endomorphism that sends X to the formal sum over F sub H of E sub I X to the P to the I. So that is a power series over um, <clears throat> F P to the H. I'm looking at the... Uh, mod p reduction of it um and that is a that's an endomorphism of the mod p to the the mod p reduction of the honda formal group law um okay so again every element in this ring and h that i've defined can be re written uniquely as a power series in s with coefficients of a particular form. And I'm, now I'm gonna describe some additional properties of this ring and H. Um, <clears throat> every such expression, of every power series in which e, the, the coefficient E sub zero isn't zero is invertible in that ring. And the Morava stabilizer group is the group of units and H cross. That's how the Morava stabilizer group is defined. So it's the group of power series uh, of this form where E sub zero isn't zero. So that means E sub zero is uh, a root of unity. Um, now we can also talk about the um, uh, extended Morava stabilizer group, which is defined to be the semi-direct product of the group that I've just defined with the Galois group of FP to the H over FP. That's known as the extended Morava stabilizer group, G sub H. <laughs> now, um, if I take this, this ring that I've defined and H, now it is a as I mentioned, it is a, as a module over ZP, it's free of rank H squared. Now I could tensor it over ZP with QP. And if I do that, I get a division algebra um, over the p-adic numbers. And if uh, such division algebras are classified by something called the Brouwer invariant. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. But in this, the Brouwer invariant is an element in Q mod Z. And in this case, it's one over H. Um, <clears throat> and inside this division algebra, N H is a maximal order, meaning a, uh, <clears throat> it's a subring, uh, it's a subring uh, that is free, of, that's, uh, a finitely generated free module over ZP, and it's the large and it's a maximal among all such subrings. <clears throat> now, 
Now, this division algebra has a really interesting property, uh, and that is that it contains within it every uh, finite extension of the piat, every degree H field extension of the piatic numbers. Every degree H field extension of the piatic numbers is sitting inside this division algebra as a commutative subring. The division algebra itself isn't commutative, but it has these various commutative subrings, namely all the field extensions of all the degree H field extensions of the piatic numbers. Um, <clears throat> and the maximal order end H contains the ring of integers of every such field. Um, <clears throat> now, one field of particular interest um, <clears throat> is the field that you let's say that let's say that um h is divisible by this number p minus one times p to the i minus one now that is the degree of the field extension that you have that you have to, by adjoining p to the ith roots of unity if you adjoin p to the ith roots of unity to the q attic to the p attic numbers qp uh, that's a field extension whose degree is this number. So um, in that case, there is a p to the ith root of unity in this field, and therefore there's a p to the ith root of unity in end h. Uh, so that means that the group sh, the Morava stabilizer group, has an element of order p to the i if and only if this number divides h. Now, it's very interesting, very interesting things happen when the Morava stabilizer group SH has an element of order P or an element of order P to the I for some larger I. Um, <clears throat> there is a classification of the all the finite subgroups uh, of G sub H. They've been classified by someone named uh, Cedric Bujard. You can find this, uh, you can find his preprint on my archive. Um, now, uh, so in particular, S4 at the prime two has a cyclic subgroup of order eight, and that was used in the proof of the Curvair invariant, the solution to the Curvair invariant problem by Hill and Hopkins and myself. Um, uh, SP minus one for an odd prime has an, a, an element of order P, and that was, and that subgroup was used in the solution to what I call the odd primary Curvair invariant, and that happened. That was uh, that happened in the late seventies. Um, and we know, and there's some other things we know. We know the mod p cohomology of S one and S two for all primes. We know that of S three if the prime is at least five. Uh, we also know H one and H two for all heights. And um, we know that a S H has cohomological dimension H squared when P minus one does not divide H. And finally, the cohomology of the fourth stabilizer group for primes larger than five has been announced by Andrew Salch. Um, uh, he hasn't written, he hasn't published the paper yet, but he says he, he knows the answer. <clears throat> now, recall um, <clears throat> that uh, Morava's height H orbit is the set of FP valued ring homomorphisms uh, <clears throat> on this ring. So you take L, you kill the ideal I sub H, and then you invert V sub H. Uh, this implies the following change of rings isomorphism that was uh, proved by Haynes Miller and myself. And it is that uh, <clears throat> if you're interested in computing X of the, the, the Brown Peterson style X group for uh, <clears throat> the ring that you get from BP star by killing VH or killing I sub H and inverting V sub H, that is the same thing as the mod P cohomology of the Morava stabilizer group S sub H. 
So we can identify this X group with the cohomology of the Morava stabilizer group. And as I indicated on the previous slide, we know quite a bit about the cohomology of the Morava stabilizer group. We don't know it. We don't know all of it, we, but we know a lot about it. A lot about it. Now, the statement I just made here isn't quite right. There's some caveats having to do with grading that I won't go into, but you can find them in the green book. <clears throat> Um, and the Green Book, Chapter 6, describes methods for calculating the cohomology of the Morava stabilizer group. Now, um, so now I'm going to talk about, uh, what am I talking about? Um, the chromatic spectral sequence. So this was introduced, uh, first introduced, um, <clears throat> This was first introduced in a paper that uh, Haynes Miller and Steve Wilson and I wrote in the 70s. Uh, so it goes like this. So it's a way of uh, bringing Morava's vision down to earth and seeing how it's reflected in the structure of the Adams novikov E2 term. So we're going to construct a long exact sequence of co-modules that has this form. And that's known as the chromatic resolution. <clears throat> My reasons for calling it that, the reasons for calling that will become apparent uh, in a moment. But there's a long exact sequence of BP star co-modules that's known as the chromatic resolution. Um, <clears throat> now, if you have such a long exact sequence, then standard homological algebra will give you a spectral sequence uh, that involves the X groups for these modules M upper H, and it converges to the X group for BP star. Standard, standard homological algebra gives you such a thing. And this is known as the uh, chromatic spectral sequence. Okay, so what are these M's, you may ask? Um, so the H column of this chromatic spectral sequence, um, <clears throat> let's see, I see there's a typo here. The H column, uh, <clears throat> the, the column where the first subscript, the first superscript over here is H, that is going to describe VH periodic phenomena in the uh, adams novikov E2 term. So this decomposition of the adams novikov E2 term, we're decomposing it into its various frequencies. Uh, so this is like a spectrum in the uh, astronomical sense of the term, and that is the reason for, the, for, for using the term chromatic. Okay, so what is this thing? <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> I want to construct a long exact sequence, and I'm going to do so by splicing together various short exact sequences that I will use the term chromatic uh, for. So <clears throat> the first one is BP star into M0, whatever that, which is yet to be defined. And then there's a quotient N1. Then I will map N1 to another gadget, M1, and so on. I'll define various short exact sequences, and you splice them together to get this long exact sequence up here. Okay, so what is this one? Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about the first of these short exact sequences. So uh, M upper zero is defined to be BP star uh, tensored with Q. You just tensor with Q. In other words, you invert P. Um, and uh, so we're looking at the map from BP star into its tensor product with the rationals. And then the quotient is the tensor product of BP star with Q mod the P local integers, QP mod ZP, or Q mod Z localized at P. And that thing is the co-limit 
over I of BP star mod P to the I. So you can map BP star mod P into BP star mod P squared into BP star mod P cubed and so on. And the co-limit is the thing that I'm calling BP star mod P infinity. So that's the first of these chromatic short exact sequences. <clears throat> this is the first one. Now, um, <clears throat> For the next one, I want to, uh, and so in the first one, I inverted P. Now for the next one, I want to invert V1 somehow. But this is tricky because um, <clears throat> inverting V1 in the comodule care category requires some care. And I'm gonna tell you what the, exactly what the difficulty is. Um, <clears throat> so let's consider this BP star module. So we could take BP star and formally invert V1. That's easy enough. But is that a co-module? That's the question. Um, now, the right unit on V1 is V1 plus PT1. Um, <clears throat> so that means... Um, <clears throat> We could formally say that the we could formally define the right unit on v1 to the k to be the kth power of v1 plus p t1, and that's a uh, the binomial theorem tells us that that's this this sum uh, that you see here. Now, um, <clears throat> the tricky thing is if k happens to be negative, then this sum is infinite. This is an infinite sum, not a finite sum, which means it does not actually lie in uh, <clears throat> V1 inverse of BP star BP, because BP star BP only contains finite sums of this sort. It does not contain infinite sums. So uh, this, this um, expression doesn't live in BP star BP, that means that um, <clears throat> V1 inverse of BP star isn't a co-module. That's why this is tricky. However, um, we claim that if you, if, if instead of doing this on BP star, you do it on BP star mod P infinity, then that is a co-module, even though uh, <clears throat> the thing we've just been looking at is not a co-module. So I'm going to explain this point. Um, so here's here again. Uh, here again is our uh, our expression. Um, so um, each element in BP star mod p to the infinity can be written as a fraction of the following form. It's x over p to the j where j is positive and x is some element in BP star that is not divisible by p. Now, if x was, if you've had an element that was divisible by p, then uh, using the usual rules of fractions, you could replace it by, replace the fraction by something with a smaller denominator. You could, you could, in which, a, where a smaller power of p occurs in the denominator. So I'm assuming here that the fraction has been reduced to lowest terms, which means that x, the x in the numerator is not divisible by p. Now, um, and we also, and the convention is that this element is killed by mul multiplication by p to the j. This, this, this gadget bp star mod p infinity consists entirely of p torsion. And this is how the p torsion works. If you have a fraction where the denominator is p to the j and you multiply it by p to the j, you get zero. Okay, so now let's look at this sum that we've been looking at. Let's, let's, so we're gonna look at the analog of this sum where uh, instead of, um, <clears throat> Instead of uh, V1 to the K, we have V1 to the K X over P to the J. And you're gonna get an expression like this, uh, but now notice that 
in the denominator, we now have p to the j minus p to the i, which means it's a finite sum. The terms up here where i is greater than or equal to j are going to vanish down here. So what was an infinite sum up here becomes a finite sum here. So uh, this means that we can formally invert V1 in BP star mod P infinity, and we still have ourselves a co-module. So that's the technical point that you have to be careful with. So that means we can make sense of inverting, we can, we can talk, we can invert V1, we can start with this gadget, and invert V1, and we still have a co-module. <laughs> and then I'm gonna denote the, the co-kernel of that map uh, by this. So elements in here can be written in a similar way as fractions uh, that have powers, positive powers of P and V1 in the denominator. <clears throat> so in a similar manner, we can work by induction and uh, in, in, in N2, we can formally invert V2 and so on. So we can define um, <clears throat> short exact sequences for larger values of H of this form. And then we splice all those together. And that gives us the desired long exact sequence um, that leads to uh, the chromatic, that's the chromatic resolution. And that leads to the chromatic spectral sequence. Now, um, so we need, so in order to use this, we need to calculate the X groups associated with these, with these co-modules, with these, these fancy co-modules. So how do we do that? Um, now, remember the change of rings isomorphism that I mentioned a few slides ago. So the change of rings isomorphism says that this guy is uh, essentially the cohomology of the Morava stabilizer group, which is something we have ways of computing. So for H equals one, um, there's a short exact sequence. This is different from the one I had before. Um, there's a short exact sequence that goes like this. So this is our M1 here, V1 inverse BP star mod P infinity. There's a, you can map it to itself using multiplication by P, that map is onto, because this is a P divisible gadget that we're looking at. Everybody in, M, everybody in M1 is divisible by P. So multiplication by P is onto, and the kernel of that map is this gadget. So there's a short exact sequence of co-modules that looks like this. Now, um, this leads to a Bockstein spectral sequence, which relates the X group associated with this gadget to the X group associated with M1. And uh, um, uh, <clears throat> this leads to a Bockstein spectral sequence. And the point is that um, <clears throat> the X group for this is the cohomology of the first Morava stabilizer group. And so we're relating that to the X group for the M1 that we're actually interested in. Now, this is what happens for H equals one. For H equals two, there are two such short exact sequences that look like this. Um, one of them, so the first one involves multiplication by P. The second one involves multiplication by V1. <clears throat> and uh, this M02 is the gadget whose X group is the cohomology of the second Morava stabilizer group. And so it's related by a sequence of two Bockstein spectral sequences to the X group of the M upper two that we actually want in the, that actually occurs in the chromatic resolution. So there's, uh, <clears throat> so um, each of these short exact sequences leads to a Bockstein spectral sequence. So that makes the desired X of M2 two steps removed 
from this quantity here, which is, uh, well, it is known explicitly because it is the cohomology of the second Morava stabilizer group. And we know that explicitly for all heights. <clears throat> now, um, more generally, uh, when we go to height H, there's going to be H of these short exact sequences. And uh, that means each one of them leads to a Bockstein spectral sequence. And this makes the X group that we need H steps removed from the cohomology of the stabilizer group S sub H. Um, <clears throat> so this is how the chromatic spectral sequence works. Now, I'm going to make one more comment. You've got to deal with all these Bockstein spectral sequences, and that computing with them can be quite delicate. Um, nearly every such computation published since uh, since the paper that since the paper we published in 1977, nearly every other such computation has been done by uh, Katsumi Shimomura. Um, <clears throat> Oh, I misspelled his name. Katsumi Shimomura uh, and his and various co-authors. So uh, that's where I'm going to stop today. So thank you very much. Hey, yeah, thank you. Let's first thank Doug for the great talk.